well, thank you for inviting me here, although I invited myself. Uh, I'm, I'm Jerry Tuttle. I'm a retired fellow of the Casualty Actuarial Society, and I'm a Fort Myers snowbird. And I like to tell people about the actuarial career. So here are some of the things I want to talk about. What is an actuary? How the profession has been rated? Uh, the all important how much money you can make? And I will disclose how much I made uh, when I retired. What do casualty actuaries do? How to prepare for a career? And how to find out more? So here are the two most famous actuaries in movies. Jack Nicholson, who is in the movie about Schmidt, and Ben Stiller. Uh, I think it was uh, something about Polly or something about Mary, one or the other. Uh, actuaries are the mathematicians in the insurance business, and we deal with the financial impact of risk and uncertainty. And we uh, develop and validate models and communicate them to other people in the company who are not actuaries, uh, which is one of the more challenging parts of, of, of work. Uh, it's one thing to tell other actuaries what you do, uh, it's entirely different to tell people who are not actuaries what you do, and those are the ones who need to understand what you do and make decisions on it. Uh, here are the various places that actuaries work. Uh, it's mostly insurance companies, and there are property and casualty companies and life insurance companies. Uh, there's also the employee benefit industry, uh, various other financial service organizations, uh, and the government. Uh, I'm a casualty actuary, and casualty generally means uh, lawsuits, uh, also property, but uh, people suing each other. Uh, that's what I'm into. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's not hard to, uh, to watch the news or read the newspaper and see ways that uh, someone's going to get sued and some insurance policy is going to cover it. Uh, so, for example, uh, uh, the uh, terrible things with the uh, Olympic athletes and Michigan State. Uh, it's certainly been the news recently. You, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, when I hear that, uh, I think of uh, uh, someone is going to sue Michigan State. Uh, and they probably have insurance for that. And there are a whole host of, uh, of issues involving the insurance. What years do things happen? Which policies are going to cover? Um, and this is part of what the, what the wacky world of insurance does. Uh, here are the various areas that casualty actuaries work. Uh, we recommend the prices to charge. Um, we evaluate claims in the aggregate, not claim by claim. Uh, so I can't look at your roof and tell you what the damage is. Uh, but I'm concerned with, in the aggregate, everyone's roof. And what are the patterns over time of how long it takes for claims to get settled, and uh, uh, that's reserving. Uh, capital adequacy, uh, how much capital does a company need? Uh, you don't want too much because the investors want it back. Uh, reinsurance, uh, and actually uh, most of my career I've been in reinsurance. This is my uh, last employer, Renaissance Reinsurance. Uh, just as people buy insurance, insurance companies buy insurance, now it's called reinsurance, uh, and more. So here is what's involved in rate making pricing. Uh, we, we generally have a current set of rates and we ask the question, are these current rates meeting our objectives? Um, I'm sure everyone uh, has a car uh, in this audience. Uh, it's not the case in New York City where I grew up. Uh, I didn't have a car until I was 25. I took the subway everywhere. Uh, but you probably are aware that uh, young people pay more for insurance than older people. Uh, men pay more than women. And there are other categories. And uh, uh, you can think of a, uh, a multi-dimensional cube. I mean, obviously a cube is three dimensions. Uh, if you can picture uh, more than three, these various different axes are the various classes in which we categorize uh, customers, and there is a rate for each of them. Uh, so we want to know, are some classes performing better than others? 
and uh, do we need to raise the rates in some classes and can we lower the rates in some classes? Uh, how do driving patterns influence the risk of loss? Um, and one of the things casually actuaries believe in and the public probably does not is if you've had an accident you are more likely to have one in the future than people who have not had one before. And of course, I don't mean you individually, I mean the group of people. Uh, casually actuaries absolutely believe the group of people who have had an ac accident are more likely to have one in the future than those who haven't. And if you've studied probability, of course, that's conditional probability. Uh, the public does not get that. The public thinks we raise their rate because we're trying to recoup the cost of the claim. That's not the reason. We now have new information. And is that, is that uh, just people who have caused accidents, or is it just anybody who's been involved in one? Uh, it's generally the people who have caused them. Okay. Uh, loss reserving, uh, I talked about that briefly. Uh, at the end of the year, we need to put aside an amount of money that will pay for the ultimate amount of claims that have occurred recognizing that claims take many years to estimate and to settle. And as a very simple example, uh, I was actually in an auto accident on New Year's Eve one year. Uh, I certainly didn't report it to my insurance company that night. I mean, they, they'd gone home, you know, three in the afternoon. Uh, but in theory, they need to put on their accounting books an estimated cost for that claim. Uh, not so much as that individual claim, but all claims that have occurred as of that date and previous. Uh, and that, that's sort of a simple example. Uh, if you know anything about lawsuits, lawsuits can take many years. Uh, it can take many years for things to develop. And so, for example, the, uh, the, the medicine uh, you're taking today, uh, you may discover five years from now, that's going to cause some very unexpected uh, illness to develop. Uh, nobody knew about that today, but it's today's doctor and today's medical care and today's policy uh, that's going to cover that claim. And we need to put money aside to pay for that. Uh, more interestingly, I think, is we're interested in the probability distribution of claims liabilities. Uh, it's, it's hard enough to come up with a single point expected value uh, but we're interested in the distribution, and uh, I'm, I'm sure this group has had enough statistics so you know something about distributions. When, uh, when distribution, is there a particular distribution amongst all the distributions? Uh, well, first we like skewed, okay. uh, because insurance claims, uh, <laughs> insurance, insurance claims are not symmetrical. And just, just thinking about automobile accidents, uh, there are many more small claims than large ones. There's lots of fender benders. There's not that many total, total claims. Is it large, normal? So, so, yes, so we're looking for positively skewed. Uh, so we like lot normal, gamma, Weibull, and things like that. Um, and and like, like many things in math, you start off learning the simple ones. You start with the normal. Um, and then you advance from that into more interesting ones. And the really interesting ones uh, uh, have some uh, computational difficulties and sometimes you use things like simulation with them. Uh, another question actuaries deal with is capital. Um, and the analogy, uh, uh, now, now you folks may not know this, but uh, in the olden days people would carry cash. Remember cash? Right? Nowadays, <laughs> nowadays it's all on a debit card, right? You, you buy a dollar coffee, you put in your debit card. But we used to carry cash. And you used to carry cash not only for the amount of your normal day's expenses, but a little extra in case of emergency. Um, and insurance companies have the same issue with capital. Uh, we need not just enough capital to get by, but capital in case of an emergency. And what's an emergency? An emergency is a hurricane. Uh, or three hurricanes, which uh, sometimes happen. Um, and so the issue is how much capital does an insurance company need? Um, and that, that varies based on the different kinds of business that's insured. Uh, 
I've, I've spent uh, the latter part of my career in reinsurance. So as I mentioned, insurance, people buy insurance, insurance companies buy reinsurance. And as an example, just, uh, just take this building by itself. I mean, I don't know what this building would cost if, if it was totally destroyed. Um, $50 million, just to pick a number. And suppose this was the only building at FGCU, and the person who buys the insurance had to go out and buy a $50 million policy on this building. Uh, they could find a $50 million policy. Someone would sell them a $50 million policy. Maybe uh, Liberty Mutual, just, just to name a company. Uh, Liberty would happily sell them the policy and, uh, and the college, the university would be happy. Liberty then turns around and says, whoa, 50 million? That's a lot of potential liability. I don't want to really keep that much. So they would find another insurance company and they might, they might want to find uh, five of them and uh, each of the five would take 20% uh, of that 50 million. Uh, or they might do it on an excess basis, and excess is sort of like deductibles. So maybe Liberty Mutual says, uh, you know, we, we can handle a $20 million claim with no problem, but anything over and above 20, uh, we want to stop our liability at 20. And so they would find a company who would come in only if the claim is in excess of 20 million. So if there is a $25 million claim, this other company would pay five, and Liberty's liability is, is capped at the 20. So this is what reinsurance does, and getting back to probability distributions, so the reinsurance company is clearly <coughs> only interested in the tail. They don't care what happens to the, uh, the area around the expected value and to the left. They only care about the tail with a lot less data. Uh, so these companies are also doing pricing and reserving, but they've got a lot less data. Uh, here are some of the newer fields, uh, catastrophe modeling. Uh, there are people who specialize in catastrophes, uh, such as hurricanes, and this, this is an area that combines uh, uh, meteorology uh, and, uh, and mathematics. Uh, uh, what was the big hurricane of 92? Of course, you guys weren't born in 92, right? No. Andrew? It was Hurricane Andrew. Uh, in, in Hurricane Andrew, uh, Hurricane Andrew had a lot of uh, Florida mobile home claims, which were a great surprise to the insurance industry because we just never asked that question. There was a big, big New Jersey company, and nobody asked this New Jersey company, by the way, you guys don't write Florida mobile homes, do you? Nobody thought to ask that. And uh, everyone who insured or reinsured them, rather, just, just got killed. Uh, nowadays, uh, uh, catastrophe modeling is a very specialized area of, uh, of insurance, and things are, uh, are done, are modeled uh, down to the individual building level. And, uh, and a company will decide uh, what's the maximum amount of hurricane loss they want, and with what sort of probability. So with, uh, with, with a 95% probability, this, this is the amount I can handle. And uh, so maybe that same Liberty Mutual says 20 million with a 90% probability. Uh, and obviously it takes a very specialized kind of analysis to do that. Uh, predictive analytics, uh, do you teach that here? Uh, we can't, I mean, we don't teach it as a course, but we teach it, you know, uh, some of our uh, courses as a kind of a topic, okay. not, not too much in depth. Okay. Uh, this, is, uh, this is not one of my areas of expertise, but I guess uh, regression is sort of prerequisite to the more general predictive analytics. I think that here is a class of business analytics. Kind of similar. Uh, there's some overlap, although this, this, this is the more mathematical end. Uh, credit score is, uh, is one area of this where uh, uh, credit scores have been around a long time. Uh, it's, uh, it's only rec fairly recently that they've been used in, in insurance. And credit actuaries feel that credit scores add a whole other layer to everything else we know about insurance that among otherwise similar individuals, people with different credit scores have different uh, uh, loss probabilities. And the higher the credit score, uh, the better 
the, the claims experience and, and vice versa. Uh, superimposed on everything else we know about insurance. Credit scores is an example of this. Uh, in sports, Moneyball uh, began this. Uh, people started looking at all sorts of sports statistics that had not been looked at before. Uh, in, in basketball recently, uh, someone has decided that, uh, I think it's called wingspan, uh, among two people who are both 6'6", six, six, uh, one of them has a bigger wingspan than the other. And for years, nobody thought of measuring that. And everything else being equal, well, wouldn't you want the person with the larger wingspan? And uh, the, these are among the areas in predictive analytics. It's a very rich field for insurance, and uh, people are studying more and more things which are not uh, precisely insurance related, but in the, with the, the goal of coming up with uh, uh, greater ability to, to classify risk. Um, the, the newer exposures are the ones which, uh, which really excite me. This, this is just a golden age for people to start their careers actuaries. I mean, I, I, I almost feel badly that I've retired and I missed it. Uh, but this, you, your generation is going to be working on self-driving cars, drones, terrorism, cyber terrorism, social media liability, and so on, uh, cell phones. Uh, uh, cell phones have been around not all that long. You know, who's to say 10 years from now we're all going to come down with some sort of disease because we've had the, our cell phones for years and uh, there, there has not been 20 years of claims experience on it. Um, and self-driving cars, there's no years of experience on it. You know, everything we know about auto insurance, such as young people are worse drivers than older people, is out the window with self-driving cars. The 17-year-old driver is no worse a driver than the 35-year-old with a self-driving car. The issue is how does the Google car compare with the Amazon car or whoever else is doing that? And when there's an accident, uh, you know, how do we, uh, how do we determine uh, you know, what the Google car is different than the Amazon car? Your generation is going to work on this, which I find terribly exciting. You're going to be developing models for, for things where there's not a lot of data and, uh, and all these other fields, drones, cyber terrorism, yes? In the self-driving car, is the creator of the software, the one who built the car, the programmer, who's liable? Potentially all these, oh, yeah, potentially all these people, people. although in, in, in the long run, it'll be the deepest pocket, <laughs> which, which is not the programmer. <laughs> you know, if, the, if there's an issue with Google's car, it's, it's probably not just with one car. It's probably with, you know, whatever million they sell. And the programmer certainly did not buy enough insurance for that. But, it, but in theory, yes, the programmer can be sued. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but in any case, the, these, are, these are all fields where there's, there's just not a lot of data. Uh, the world is changing very quickly. And, and this is why casually actuarial work, I think, is very exciting. And uh, uh, I actually have a niece in Florida. Uh, she's on the East Coast, and she's a health actuary. And, oh, you picked health insurance? There's, there's nothing really new about health insurance. People are getting sick and people are dying no differently than they've done for, for, dec for, for centuries. You know, this is the exciting area to be in. And, uh, for, for you people who think you want to become actuaries, how you cannot choose casually actuary, I, I can't believe it. You know, this is where the action is. Uh, I guess I need to move a little quicker. Uh, there are lots of people that rate the professions. Um, for many years, actuary's been number one. We get upset when we move to number two. Uh, someone rated us as number 11, but uh, lots of other math professions are above us, so we don't feel too bad. Uh, we're, we're just always highly rated, uh, and that's part because the, uh, the earnings potential is, uh, is just really so high. Uh, you advance by examinations, uh, which is very different than most other fields. Most other fields, how do you get ahead? Who knows? Uh, in actuarial, it's very, very clear. You pass exams and you get a, a bonus. Uh, and or a raise. 
Um, there are advancement opportunities throughout your career. Graduate school is not required. Uh, I have a master's degree, and uh, I think it may be a better math student, but it was not at all required. And these are among the organizations that rank professions and, and rank us high. Okay, now we get to the, the part people really want to know about. Um, actually, I, I emailed a couple of uh, uh, acquaintances in Florida uh, the past week. Uh, and they told me that they start people at uh, between sixty and seventy thousand uh, dollars, people right out of school. Um, but the minimum requirement is uh, is really two exams. Uh, it used to be no exams decades ago, then it went up to one. Uh, but because we've been so highly rated, everyone knows about this. It's uh, it's very competitive to get your foot in the door. Uh, if you're not going to have two exams. Uh, as you start looking for a job, you're competing with people who have two exams. And uh, for better or worse, we assume that uh, the probability of success in future exams is related to showing us that you've passed a couple of exams. So you absolutely have to pass a couple of exams. Um, and consulting actuaries and company presidents uh, can just make enormous amounts of money. How much money? Uh, this is a publicly available website. Uh, these show, this shows the Fellows of the Casualty Actuarial Society, which is the, the top graph in whatever the heck color that is. Uh, I don't know, as we talked about. It's clearly green. <laughs> uh, not on my slide. Uh, and other, which are non-casualty actuaries, um, and this is a sample, and this is uh, a, a probably a biased sample. Uh, hopefully when you take statistics you know something about uh, biased samples. This sample comes from a recruiter. Uh, so it's not all the actuaries in the business, it's only the sample of the data this recruiter has collected. And then within those points, uh, I think those are median points. Uh, but nevertheless, the, uh, the, the actuary with eight years of experience is somewhere around 180,000 as a median uh, and so on. And uh, your advisor left, so he won't hear this unless he watches the, uh, the video. Uh, I will disclose how much I made when I retired, and it was 230,000 salary. Um, and then there were bonuses. Uh, in a good year, uh, I could make an additional 50 to 100 percent of salary. Um, and a good year is a year with no hurricanes. Mm -hmm. So if I had been working in 2017, uh, I would not be getting a bonus in 2018 uh, for the reasons you people are well aware of. Uh, but most years do not have awful hurricanes. And for many years, uh, there were bonuses. Uh, and so I, I retired at 230, uh, which I, I can't complain about. Um, and I was somewhere in the middle of the pack. Uh, I was not among the highest. I was not among the lowest. Uh, I reported to a company president. Uh, you just missed how much money I made when I retired. You'll have to ask them afterwards. Uh, uh, but, I, but I reported to a company president uh, who just made enormous amounts of money. Uh, and uh, there's a reason that she was president and I was not. She had various skills which I did not have. Uh, I. My career went in a certain direction. Uh, there are ways to make more money, and that's as a consultant, where senior cons consultants are getting a proportion of the, the income that you generate. Uh, I didn't do that. Uh, a so lot of people... Can you share those skills with our students? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. Okay. Um, but certainly I made a, a decent amount of money. I have no complaints about the money. I'll put it in perspective, to earn over $200,000, you have to be a full professor at an Ivy League school. Okay, well, I went, to, I went to Queens College, who nobody's heard of in this room, although, although maybe people have. 
uh, not an Ivy League school at all. Um, and that, that didn't hold me back. Uh, these are the casually actuarial exams, and, and these are always in flux. Uh, I hope they're current, uh, but I'm never quite sure. Um, so these two are, are financially oriented. Uh, these are a little more statistically oriented. Uh, some of you know that uh, we give credit for corporate finance and economics. Uh, if your college teaches the right course, uh, do you know if you do? Yeah, You've yeah. gotten approved by yeah. the program? Good. Yes. Yeah, if you think of, feel for okay. statistics for example. Okay. Uh, we also learn accounting, law, regulation, ethics. Uh, ethics is very interesting. Uh, there are people who resigned from their jobs because the professional ethics have, have said, uh, uh, Mr. Employer, I'm, I'm not going to do what you're asking me to do. I'd rather resign. Uh, not an easy thing to do. Uh, but, but the point is, we have a, we have a fairly broad insurance slash business education. And uh, uh, while I'm not an accounting expert, uh, despite the fact that I'm teaching accounting, an embarrassing fact, but true. Uh, but nevertheless, I probably know more accounting as an actuary than most people in the in the insurance company, other than the accountants. And similarly, I've studied law and regulation and so on. And these these things are all part of uh, what's what's valuable in an actuarial career. Uh, you may not know about this, but the C the Casual Actuarial Society is moving towards technical logically based exams. Do you know that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're going to let you take your exam at home, uh, but it's going to be proctored. Uh, there's going to be an individual proctor watching you, watching your eyes, watching your mouth, watching your hands, scanning the room. Uh, we haven't done this yet. Uh, we're starting this in a couple of months. Uh, the Actuarial Society is convinced we can, we can do this efficiently. Uh, prevent cheating and save some money rather than requiring that uh, you all drive to whatever the exam site is. Um, so this is uh, something very new to us. Uh, we hope it works. Uh, most casual actuarial society members work for insurance companies, uh, but a big group <coughs> works for consultant and reinsurance. Uh, there are some academic uh, people. Uh, I assume there's no FCAS is on the staff here, uh, but some of the other Florida universities do have some. Uh, I think if, if you had one of those things, then probably you'd be making 200 plus too. <laughs> uh, you can work in government, uh, and there are some, uh, some miscellaneous places to work. Um, uh, for, for example, uh, Hertz Rental Car, uh, just as an example. Hertz Rental Car, uh, how many rental cars does Hertz have? I have no idea. A hundred thousand? A million? I have no idea. Their, their global uh, headquarters is here, right? Yeah, uh, in the uh, Hertz. Hertz. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know that. <laughs> um, but imagine how many cars they have. Uh, well, they don't go out and buy a conventional insurance policy. They have so many cars, their insurance experience is as predictable as an insurance company is. So Hertz probably has an actuary on staff, and they probably self-insure their exposure, or they, they uh, maybe they buy an insurance policy, but maybe it has a $20 million deductible, something like that. Uh, so Hertz is an example of a place that might have, uh, have an actuary, and uh, many large businesses do. They contact us, they, they still, they also want to give a presentation, they also want to meet our students, they, they're still in con contact, touch, constant contact uh, with us, but uh, you're not able to meet their needs. Uh, where are the jobs? Uh, mostly in the big cities. Uh, in this state, uh, they're on the East Coast. Uh, not, not too many here, although I just saw a job in Sarasota today. Uh, Sarasota is looking for someone just out of school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but they're mostly in the big cities or the suburbs. Uh, consulting companies, accounting firms. Uh, here's, uh, here's how to find employers of casualty actuaries. There's a site called actuarialdirectory.org. 
and you go on that and you search uh, the city you're interested in, search for C excuse me, CAS designations, and that will find that will give you the, the chief actuary at uh, uh, Towers Hill Insurance Company, just, just to pick a, a Florida company that I know has actuaries. Uh, hopefully you do want casually actuarial society uh, designations. And uh, I, I should say that, uh, that for, for the students, if you're 22 or so, and you're ready to look for your first full-time job, um, consider the whole country. You know, unless something really ties you to, to where you live, uh, and some people do, I, I get that, but if you're not tied to uh, where you live, you know, look at Denver, look at San Francisco, look at Chicago, Atlanta, you know, what's, what's keeping you where you live? Uh, and and I, I did the same thing when, uh, when it was my first job, although it's uh, slightly different. Um, I lived in New York City, my first job was New Jersey, but for someone who didn't drive, I mean, that was like the other end of the world. <laughs> it was a big deal getting that job in New Jersey. Uh, but, but more seriously, don't, uh, I don't know if you're Floridians, but uh, don't, don't feel you're confined to, uh, to Florida. Uh, here are the skills that uh, I, I think uh, companies are looking for. Uh, certainly analytical problem solving skills, uh, business sense, uh, and, and really as actuaries we're business people. We're business people who know a lot of math, uh, in contrast to uh, math people who know some business. I mean, the problems actually solve are business problems. Uh, nobody is going to ask you to solve this triple interval. Uh, what they're going to ask you is, uh, how, how are we going to develop a model for, uh, for drones? You know, what, uh, what, what makes one drone different from another? What makes one drone riskier than another? And you wouldn't do that in isolation. You'd probably be doing that as a team. Um, but, the, but the point is we're looking for uh, business solving skills and someone who's interested in that. Uh, you're not going to be a pure mathematician in the actual business. Uh, good communication skills. I, I think I talked about this briefly. Um, that, that really you present your analysis to people who are not actuaries and to people who make decisions on, on, uh, on your analysis. Uh, and they don't care about the math. They don't care how clever you are in, uh, in uh, how many parameters was the Pareto distribution. No, but nobody cares about that. Um, but you need to explain what you did. And uh, if I can digress just, just a minute, um, one of the things I, that took me 40 plus years to understand is that uh, uh, over the course of my career, uh, the mathematical demands of me increased quite a lot. Uh, as they did for the profession. The, uh, the, the papers written by the profession grew and the techniques and the math I needed grew. And uh, that's not a surprise and that was fun. The surprise was that everyone else's skills also had to increase. So the discussions I had with the marketing people 40 years ago were much different than the discussions I had a couple of years ago. And a couple of years ago, uh, those people had to worry about uh, internal rates of return and simulations and what kind of distribution was I using for my simulation. So their mathematical demands grew. And uh, it took me a while to realize that. And all these people who don't want to study math and go into something like sales because they think there's no math, uh, you got a surprise coming for you. Uh, strong computer skills, uh, I can't tell you what language is important because every company is different. Um, uh, I personally really didn't know much more than uh, my Fortran 4 course of uh, 50 years ago and uh, Excel. Uh, I was a decent Excel user, uh, but I don't know R or C plus or SAS or something like that. Uh, but you could find a company for whom that's important. Uh, but certainly, you need some sort of computer skills, uh, knowledge of math and finance. And here are the three things that uh, when I interviewed people, I thought were always important. Uh, will you get along with your peers? Will you get along with people who are not actuaries? And will you pass exams? And as I would interview a student, 
uh, those are sort of the three things I'm trying to think about in the back of my mind. Uh, and of course, those are questions I can't ask directly because there's no answer to that. Um, but there are people who, uh, who will uh, look at your shoes when they talk to you. And, uh, you know, that's, maybe that can work actuary to actuary, but that's not going to work actuary to marketing person. Uh, that marketing person's not going to respect you if you're so shy that, uh, you know, you're looking at the other person's shoes. And, uh, and will you pass exams? We're looking for people who are going to pass all the exams and become fellows. Uh, not everyone will, and that doesn't mean your career is in shambles if you don't do that. Uh, but that's who we're looking for. And, uh, Please make note of that. That's very underlining, very important. Emphasize, italicize, bold, underlined <laughs> in <Yeah>. quotations. <laughs> a a absolutely. That's, that's the, uh, that's finally, the finally, here, here are a couple of sources. Uh, this is the first one is the Casually, Casually Actuarial Society website. Uh, there's a nice site, Be an Actuary. Uh, it's got some interviews. Uh, there's an actuarial bulletin board. Uh, which is not produced by one of the actuarial societies, uh, and it's, it's somewhat tongue-in-cheek. Uh, you can ask any question you want, but uh, people are often very sarcastic with their answers. Uh, but if you ask a serious question, you'll get an answer. Uh, I post uh, some answers to that, uh, although I post under both my name and I post under a pseudonym. Uh, so that's where the tongue-in-cheek comes from. <laughs> uh, when, when, once in a while uh, during my actual career, I, I wanted to ask a question, and I didn't want it known that it was coming from me. Uh, but it's, it's a good site. Uh, you can get lots of your communication skill. <laughs> you, you can get uh, lots of questions answered there. Uh, and these are two salary survey uh, sites. Uh, and lastly, here, here are two more talks that I, uh, that I like to do. Uh, I have a talk on actuaries and discrimination, um, which, uh, which, which I think is a little edgy. Um, and what are the consequences of discriminating and not discriminating? Uh, that's one of my talks. Uh, and lastly, I have a talk on computer simulation. Uh, has anyone had convolutions? This is among the, uh, the faculty members, so you, you know what that means. Uh, convolutions, uh, which, which was in my probability textbook of uh, 50 plus years ago, but I didn't understand it then. Uh, those are something we use in actuarial work, but there are not neat uh, analytical formulas for the distributions that interest us, and so we use simulation as one technique to answer to, uh, to solve those problems. So that concludes my formal remarks. Uh, I'm more than happy to entertain any questions.